lecture 14. We'll be discussing mitosis and the cell cycle. As usual, the list of objectives that you should be taking away from this lecture. You can pause it and read them here, or you can always go to the module page on Canvas and you can look at the PowerPoint um, that you can look through the slides yourself. So all organisms have cells that divide. And this is true for single cellular organisms or multicellular organisms. All of them will have at least one cell or multiple cells that are going to be dividing. The difference here is the purpose or the reason that these cells are dividing. When we're talking about a unicellular organism, they will be dividing in order to reproduce. Uh, if you have one bacteria uh, that becomes two cells, uh, each of those cells will be its own organism, its own bacteria that will go about its life. Um, when, it when it comes to multicellular organisms, they could be dividing for different reasons. Um, they too can be dividing in order to reproduce. Um, there has to be another, a new organism being produced from the multicellular organism. And so um, cell division can be used for reproduction. But with a multicellular organism, it could also, cell division could be used to have that organism grow. Uh, if you think of a, uh, an embryo or a fetus of a, um, a mammal, um, those organisms start off very small uh, and then they become a larger organism over time. That growth happens by uh, cell division. Uh, one cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, and so on. Uh, and those cells are now connected to one another and that organism is becoming larger and larger. Um, there's also uh, fixing, repairing, cuts or um, damage to the organism. Uh, those cells can be um, replacing the cells that have uh, died or that have become injured. When discussing cell division, uh, we should talk about the details of reproduction. Uh, so there are two types of reproducing. Um, we had talked a little bit about this in the first lecture uh, of the class uh, through the characteristics of life. Um, the first way, the first option of reproducing is asexually. Uh, many different organisms can do uh, asexual reproduction. Um, prokaryotes, which are the bacteria and the archaea, those two domains, uh, they will be asexually reproducing by binary fission. Uh, eukaryotic organisms, uh, simple eukaryotic organisms, uh, can reproduce asexually by mitosis. So when it says simple eukaryotic organisms, uh, I think it's focusing on the single cellular uh, organisms. They may, may be doing this. Simple is a misnomer here. There are some more complex organisms that can reproduce um, asexually. So basically, asexual reproduction uh, is created by one parent, and the offspring will be identical to that parent. So when we think of a cell, um, a single cellular organism reproducing to make two, uh, each of those are their own organisms. But it does not have to be single cellular organisms. You can have organisms like uh, a starfish, where if you were to rip off one of the legs of a starfish, um, that leg can grow into a new starfish. And this is called fragmentation. Uh, you can have uh, organisms that are able to um, jellyfish, where the new organism kind of buds off of the parent and then it goes free as a multicellular organism. So you can have these different processes of asexual reproduction that are all mitosis, uh, but not necessarily simple eukaryotic organisms, uh, quote unquote simple. 
sexual reproduction is the next option here. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, many mammals, uh, all mammals do it this way. Uh, birds, um, the larger eukaryotic organisms, uh, plants, fungi. Um, there are some examples in some of those last groups that can reproduce uh, asexually. But um, basically, sexual reproduction, you, you have two parents uh, producing the offspring together. So the DNA between both of the parents will come together to form an identical, I'm sorry, to form a unique offspring, a mixture between the two parents. And that's the biggest difference here uh, through these types of reproduction. Uh, you have unique offspring with sexual reproducing, uh, and unique to both parents. And as you can see by the chart here, uh, this is using meiosis, uh, which we will get a little more into. Um, there are some organisms that can do both. Uh, it is called um, parsonogenesis, and there are lots of different organisms that are able to do this. Uh, in, in the news lately, you might have heard of the um, longhorn tick that's coming in from Asia. Uh, this organism is able to do both. Uh, it can reproduce. It, it can reproduce sexually if there is a partner nearby. Uh, if there is not, then it will reproduce asexually. Uh, there are a lot of parasites that uh, are in living inside of an organism, and you don't come across another individual very often that's of your same species, and so some of them have the ability to reproduce asexually when no partner is around, or sexually if there is a partner around. There are even some organisms uh, like frogs, some species of frogs, that can do one or the other as well, uh, and parsonogenesis. I won't put this on any test because it's obviously not written up here, but just so you know uh, for your own benefit. So binary fission on the left hand side we have the parent cell uh, this would be a bacteria uh, and then it goes through cell division uh, and so before it divides it needs to reproduce its um, DNA so the one nucleoid reproduces and becomes two nucleoids so that it can separate to either end uh, and then it kind of pinches off and the cell wall fills in the gap and now you've got two cells when it separates you've got two cells two identical cells uh, through binary fission when it comes to eukaryotic organisms that asexually reproduce they will be doing it through mitosis um, here it says that eukaryotic cells do not divide by binary fission, and that is, that is a good thing to know. We'll, we'll stick with that. Um, there are some odd cases out there uh, that you can look up that um, are considered binary fission, but we'll, we'll stick to the general and say that eukaryotic organisms do not divide by binary fission. Instead, uh, they divide by mitosis. Um, mitosis is very similar to binary fission. Uh, but much more complex and we'll see the different steps to mitosis and how it differs from the simple binary fish. Most eukaryotic organisms uh, have two types of cell division. We've already discussed the first uh, which is mitosis uh, which we'll be getting into much more in this lecture. Um, mitosis is used for growth and cell replacement uh, of multicellular organisms. Uh, it occurs in somatic cells. Uh, a, a synonym to somatic cells are the body cells of the organism. So when you think of, uh, when you think of a human being, the somatic cells that makes us up is basically all the cells in our body. The only ones that are not somatic cells are our sperm and our eggs. Um, and we'll be discussing uh, the focus of this lecture will be mitosis. Meiosis is the other
type of cell division. It is used to create gametes. Um, gametes are reproductive cells. Um, in humans, it is sperm and eggs. Uh, and it incurs, occurs in the germ cells. Uh, germ cells are reproductive cells. So germ cells themselves uh, are somatic cells, um, but they will go through meiosis to create these gametes. The life cycle of a eukaryotic organism, um, and this is uh, a human organism. So let's start off by a fertilized egg or a zygote. Um, and once the egg and sperm come together, you have this, uh, this zygote, the beginning of this embryo. Uh, that zygote will start dividing by mitosis. The fetus that will grow and develop uh, from that zygote, from that embryo, uh, to become a mature adult consisting of countless cells, trillions of cells, all of those cells will be made by mitosis. Um, well, all of those cells will have the same identical DNA. Um, yes, each cell could be slightly different in the shape and form and what it's doing and, and how it's constructed, but the DNA is the same in all of these cells. Once the organism has reached sexual maturity, it will be able to produce gametes. Uh, gametes are created by meiosis. So in these mature adults, the man and the woman, they will be producing sperm and eggs. Sperm and eggs are these gametes that are made by meiosis. When those gametes come together, they will produce uh, a fertilized embryo. Um, sexual cells produced by meiosis contain half the DNA of the body cells. And so this is the major difference between mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis, the cell that is being produced, the two cells that are being produced from this cell division are both identical to the parent cell. They both have the same amount of DNA as the parent cell does. During meiosis, this is what makes it different. The cells that are being produced will have half the DNA of the parent cell. Uh, and so the sperm and the eggs that are being produced will have half the DNA of the man and the woman that are creating them. So when you have sperm with half the DNA and an egg with half the DNA, when they come together to fertilize one another, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, you will now have a cell with the full set of a human DNA. Uh, so sperm with half, an egg with half, you put it together to create a zygote with all the DNA, the full set of DNA. So meiosis, as we had discussed before, uh, meiosis is not only used for cell division, which uh, happens asexually, um, but it, ha it, it has other roles in multicellular organisms. Um, so mitosis, meiotic cell division, uh, allows an organism to grow and develop so on top, we have the picture of a embryo getting larger, uh, and this is happening through mitosis. Um, mitosis can also help with the repair of tissues or regenerating lost body parts. Um, we don't necessarily regenerate lost body parts, but there are other organisms that do. Uh, think about the, the tail of a lizard. If you, um, certain species of lizards, if their tail come off, if their tails come off, uh, they can regenerate those tails. Uh, it's a it's a defense mechanism where the tail comes off and starts wiggling around, and um, whatever predator that was going after the organism now has uh, this tail that's squirming around, and that takes their attention uh, away from the organism that can quickly get away. 
Um, some organisms will reproduce asexually uh, by mitosis, as we had discussed with single-celled organisms, but there are also multicellular organisms that can do this as well. Mitosis produces body cells, many body cells. Um, a human being, so this fetus, this zygote at the top corner, um, this is a fertilized egg. Uh, and you can see how time goes on. It becomes larger and larger. So we've got one cell becoming two, two becoming four, four becoming, uh, this is either eight or the 16. Once it starts getting more and more cells, they start to have certain characteristics to them. Uh, the embryo starts to change uh, to different ends. You'll have uh, the upper body, the lower body. Um, you'll have these stem cells that are forming certain parts of the body um, that will be all the different organs, all of the different inner parts of the body, outer parts of the body, and things just become more and more specialized. As you go through, you can see the, the different specializations. Then uh, by day 44, you have something that looks like an embryo. Uh, I'm sorry, at 28 uh, days, um, you know, you could say that that looks like an, uh, an, an embryo and getting larger and larger, larger and larger. Uh, and then by the time the human is born, we have trillions of cells that make us up. Cell death can be part of this uh, creation of life. Um, so when we think, you know, all cells have their place in this newly forming fetus, newly forming um, organism, but some of the cells that uh, have their place at one time do not have their place further down the line. Uh, and so cell death, uh, a term for this is apoptosis or programmed cell death. Uh, programmed because it's meant to be created and then destroyed. Um, in this process, we've in these pictures, we're looking at how uh, apoptosis can be used to carve out distinct structures during development. So if you look at the uh, feet of the chicken and a duck and how they're similar, uh, and so you've got these webbings between the feet, between the toes. Well, for a duck, those webbings are needed. Um, the duck is a swimmer, and this allows the duck to swim very well in water, and it's an advantageous characteristic to the duck. Whereas the chicken, it's not. And so you can see that there are certain webbing during the forming of the feet. But then, once the feet develop even more, that webbing is not going to be needed. So any of that webbing that can used to connect the toes will start to die off through apoptosis to carve out these structures. <coughs> and this is, again, apoptosis, uh, programmed cell death. This is meant to happen. Uh, and it's a normal part of development of all of these organisms, uh, and it's a balance of cell division. Before getting into the nitty-gritty of how mitosis works and all the phases uh, that go into mitosis, we're going to talk a little bit more about DNA, um, focusing on the um, condensing of DNA uh, into chromosomes. So before DNA gets into a chromosome, it is in the chromatin form. Uh, and so some of, these, some of these vocabulary terms we've already gone over, but just to reiterate, um, naked DNA, seen up here at the top, uh, the double helix. Um, this DNA wraps around histones, uh, histone proteins. Uh, and when DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins, it is called a nucleosome. Uh, nucleosomes, um, they will cluster together throughout the DNA, uh, and this is called chromatin. 
Uh, chromatin is the name for the proteins and the DNA itself. Now, as it wraps around uh, like a telephone cord, the old style telephone cords, uh, the scaffolding proteins shown here kind of keep it condensed and in place, uh, tightly packed. So the term chromatin is basically all of the DNA and the proteins in the cell's nucleus. That's what the term uh, means. When we talk about DNA being in the chromatin form, this is the form that it is usually in during the cell's life. Um, only when it gets super condensed into a chromosome is when it's getting ready for mitosis or meiosis. When it's packed together in a chromosome, the DNA cannot be opened up and replicated or transcribed. Uh, so any sort of transcription and duplication that takes place uh, has to be in this chromatin form and actually uh, opened up even more. Um, so in the chromatin form, when a particular piece of DNA needs to be transcribed or needs to be uh, duplicated, uh, it will open up. These proteins will kind of break off, uh, exposing the naked DNA itself, and that's when transcription or duplication will take place. The term chromosome is the extra condensed version of DNA as seen down here. After DNA has been replicated, it will form discrete chromosomes uh, at the beginning stage of mitosis or meiosis. The number of chromosomes uh, will differ between organisms. Uh, humans have 46 chromosomes. There are organisms with much less and there are organisms with much more. Uh, some organisms, uh, there are some plants that can have uh, hundreds of chromosomes. The highly folded chromosomes take up less space and they're easier to move around than the unwound chromatin. So the reason for these chromosomes <coughs> is to make it easier to move around during cell replication of mitosis and meiosis. If you had a large ball of string, it would be much more difficult to kind of move it around from place to place. It would snag onto things, possibly break, just being a mess. Uh, but if you were to take that string and wind it up on a spool, it would be much easier to move around. And that's how the cell is dealing with this situation when they're replicating. In this picture, uh, we have on the left hand side, um, we have a picture of a cell that the DNA is in the chromatin form. As you can see, it's loosely packed, um, just kind of balled up in this center nucleus. And basically this is kind of what it looks like when it's not going through mitosis or meiosis. Um, in this situation, DNA can be going through replication. It can be going through transcription, uh, transcription translation situation to make proteins. Um, and this is kind of the normal look of a cell. But when it's getting ready for mitosis or meiosis, uh, the DNA will be condensed into chromosomes. Um, and this is right before uh, we'll see in the prophase uh, of mitosis or meiosis, uh, this is kind of the beginning of this creation of chromosomes. Cell division is occurring when DNA condenses into these chromosomes. There is some terminology that will go along with uh, chromosomes. Um, this terminology is very important to know uh, and know the differences between uh, when I am discussing certain differences between types of cell division, types of cells themselves, uh, what is happening in these different stages of cell division, these terms will be very important when trying to understand what's going on. So the first term here is homologous chromosomes. 
a homologous pair of chromosomes is a pair of chromosomes that carry the same information about the same traits. Um, we'll talk about traits a little bit more when we're talking about genetics, but basically what you see down here on the right, uh, on the bottom right, is a pair of homologous chromosomes. One of them came from your mother, one of them came from your father. And so for every pair in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, one of each of those pairs is coming from one parent, and then the other parent is giving you the other set of those pairs. Uh, as you can see, um, the traits here. So uh, if we think of this as a gene, um, this is a gene to make protein C. Well, you're going to find that gene on this location of this chromosome, and you'll find it on the same location of its homologous uh, chromosome. And so here we have a large C, here we have a small C, so they are slightly different from one another. Um, they're going to make slightly different proteins, uh, but it will be a protein that is used in the same way. Let's say this trait is for um, blonde hair, uh, or this trait is for the color of hair. Big C is blonde hair, little C is brown hair, something like that. Uh, the term the terms diploid cells and haploid cells. These have to do with the number of chromosomes that are found in the cell. And so for diploid cell, we have 2n. The n will stand for the number of pairs of chromosomes. For humans, that's 23. So a diploid cell would have 2 times 23 which is 46, uh, and that is what most of the cells in our body have. The somatic cells in our body will have 2 times 23, or 46 chromosomes. Um, the diploid cells have two of each type of chromosome. Haploid cells is 1 times 23 for a human being. Um, they only have one of each of those chromosomes. And an example here of cells like this will be the gametes, the sperms and the eggs that are found inside of a human being. Now, gametes are unique because they are later going to be coming together to form a new organism. And so the cells of a, the somatic cells of a normal organism will be 2n. And so these gametes will be coming together, 1n plus 1n will then create the 2n situation. Uh, they have one of each type of chromosome. Now here is a picture of all the chromosomes in a human being. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, and as you can see, you know, for each of these pairs, so we've chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, each of these pairs, you will have one of them coming from your mother and one of them coming from your father. Now, I can't tell which one is coming from which parent, uh, and it could be mixed up here, but for every pair, one will be coming from your mother, one will be coming from your father. Uh, this 23rd is a little unique. Um, it's not labeled as 23, it's labeled as X. And so this is the sex chromosome. We will learn much more about this during our meiosis lecture. But basically it could be an X or a Y and is determining if, it is, if this organism is going to be a male or a female. Now a lot of the times when looking at chromosomes, you see them in these X forms. It might be hard to see, but each of them is this X form, uh, and that's because this chromosome is duplicated, um, so each of these chromosomes has gone through replication, uh, and so each of them is two of them attached to one another, uh, which will be separated later in mitosis or meiosis. Now hopefully this is not too confusing, 
Um, because really, you're seeing um, 46 times 2 chromosomes because each of these are pairs. Um, but it's, it's kind of just the way it's, it's drawn in a lot of different, way, in a lot of different locations. Uh, so humans have 46 chromosomes. Um, they are organized into 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. And again, the homologous pair is this one, and then its pair is this one. Uh, you can see that they are not attached. They are totally separate chromosomes from one another. Even though they have the same traits on them, one of them came from one parent, one of them came from another parent when this organism was formed. Um, now we're getting into uh, sister chromatids. So when I was discussing how on that chart showing the homologous chromosomes and how they are, were in a X shape situation, well, a duplicated chromosome. So during replication of DNA, every piece of DNA is duplicated. Uh, and so a normal human being has 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, and during replication, each of those 46 will duplicate itself. They will remain attached to one another. So when you have this duplicated chromosome um, spindle down and form this tight-knit chromosome, it will look like this X right here. And so this is a DNA strand condensed into a chromosome and it's attached right here to its replication. So each of these are identical to one another. They are sister chromatids. Uh, they are identical to one another and they're attached to this centromere area. They are attached to one another. So duplicated chromosomes are two copies that remain attached at the centromere. Each copy is a chromatid. Together, they make up one duplicated chromosome. And so this one and this one are sister chromatids. If you had an X over here, uh, then this could be a set of homologous chromosomes where this is one X, this is one X. But not to confuse you, um, this is showing a single because through mitosis, this will be broken apart and they will be separated from one another. We'll learn this is gonna take place in anaphase of mitosis uh, or anaphase two in meiosis. And when they are pulled apart and they go to different poles of the cell to create new cells, they will be broken off and they will both be single chromatin. Now, they'll still be probably called sister chromatids when that happens. They're just now not attached to one another. So the cell cycle uh, is a repeated series of events. Think of this cycle as basically the life cycle of the cell. Uh, many different events are taking place, not just mitosis, not just meiosis. Uh, the cell does much more than just replicate itself. Interphase is the majority of the cell's life, uh, which is shown in green. I'm sorry, shown in orange. Uh, and the blue is the cell division portion of the the life cycle. This is mitosis. Uh, sometimes this is a lot smaller. Um, it's just larger so you can read the different uh, phases. Um, in this cycle, in interphase, you will have the G1 phase. And so this says that it is the normal cell functions and cell growth. And so this is pretty much everything we've been learning about a cell, um, they're going to be living their life as normal in G1 phase. Uh, they're going to be transcribing, uh, making proteins, translating um, 
transcribing and translating, uh, making proteins, uh, eating, going through the creation of ATP, through glycolysis, through uh, cellular respiration. You're going to be doing all the normal things that you would think a cell is going to do. But then something triggers and it's going to say, um, tell that cell that it needs to replicate. And so when that happens, it goes to the S phase. Uh, the S phase is then this inside the cell, the DNA is starting to replicate. It's in this chromatin form. Uh, it's going to be replicating. It's going to be doubling in size. But still, the cell itself looks like it's going through normal functions. Once it leaves this S phase, it gets into the G2 phase. Uh, and so this is when it's the rest of the cell is preparing for division. So all the organelles are going to be doubling. Uh, all of the molecules inside the proteins are going to be rearing up and doubling. And it's going to get ready um, to go into the next phase, which is mitosis. Uh, and so we'll, we'll learn a little bit more in detail of all of these stages of mitosis. But at this moment, this line right here, all the DNA is in a chromatin form. It's not until it gets into prophase that it turns into chromosomes. Uh, and then the cytokinesis is when the actually split of the cell. Now this G0 phase, G0 phase, uh, this is some cells will never replicate again. Uh, think of our nerve cells. Our nerve cells um, are created and they're not going to create more nerve cells. And so they are living the rest of their life in this G0 phase. Uh, they're never going to duplicate their DNA because they're never going to replicate. They're just going to live in this G0 phase for the rest of their life. Um, so those different phases I'll go into more detail uh, as, as the slides go on. Uh, so interphase, uh, the time of the normal cell activities, uh, and this is the largest portion of the cell cycle. Mitosis itself um, will be the time of nuclear division. Uh, when the nucleus is being opened up and the DNA is being separated out, uh, divided to create two new cells. And then cytokinesis is the time of cytoplasm division. So this is the time where the actual cell itself, the cytoplasm, that's the inside of the cell, is being broken off into two cells, where the cytoplasm of one and the cytoplasm of the other cell now become completely separated, and we're talking about two distinct cells. Um, so interphase, uh, I've, I've gone over these phases already with you, uh, but now it's, it's written out for you in case I forgot anything. Uh, so interphase, the longest part of a cell's life, lo longest part of a cell cycle. And that could be, um, so if we think about cells in our body that are going to be replicating a lot, uh, our skin cells, our skin cells are constantly making new skin cells. Um, to replace the ones that are shedding off and, and dying cells that are being shed off. Uh, and so even them that are constantly replacing one another, the still the longest part of their life cycle is the interphase. Um, now their interphase might be a lot shorter than the interphase of, let's say, a, um, uh, in a lung cell or a... Uh, that's probably not a good example, uh, a heart cell, things like that. Um, these things could still be replicating, but skin cells are, you know, notoriously known for replicating a lot. Um, so interphase, the three stages of interphase, uh, G1, so cell grows and functions normally. It's doing everything that a cell normally does. Um, it's just kind of living its life. Uh, G0 phase, G0 phase, uh, this again, uh, the cell continues to function, but it is not going to replicate its DNA or divide anymore. Uh, most of the cells, most, most of your cells are currently living in a G0 phase, especially as an adult. 
uh, when you're not, you know, continuing to grow. You might not be, you might be growing in ways that you don't want to grow, but you're not getting taller, um, anything like that. So, so there's a lot of cells in your body that aren't continuing to grow or, or to divide. Uh, but those cells that are going through division, uh, they will hit the uh, the S phase, uh, and this is when the genome is being replicated. So we learned about DNA replication, how DNA molecules, one DNA molecule becomes two DNA molecules, uh, and they are uh, identical uh, from one another. Well, the reason that they're doing that is so that when the cell divides, one of those DNA strands goes to the new cell, the other strand goes to the other new cell. G2 phase, uh, this is when after the genome has been replicated, uh, then the cell is preparing um, other divisions. So it's getting the proteins ramped up, getting ready for mitosis. Uh, when I say proteins, lots of enzymes are going to be used. Uh, the organelles are being replaced, so uh, are not replaced they're being produced. So if you think about uh, all of those mitochondrias that are in your cell, they're all needing to duplicate so that each new cell is going to get enough mitochondria to do all of the cellular respiration that it needs to do. Uh, think about the Golgi bodies. Think about the endoplasmic reticulum. All of these things are going to be dividing amongst the two cells so that each cell has what it needs. Then you get into mitosis, uh, and this is a period of nuclear division. This is when the cell is going to be exposing its DNA to the cytoplasm of the cell and separating it out to each pole of the cell to separate that out into both cells that are going to be created. There are five stages. Prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. It will be important for you to remember these phases, uh, knowing the order that they go in. And it will be important to understand the particulars that are happening in each of these phases. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of what you're being tested on with this lecture will go into knowing these phases. Uh, also knowing interphase, which we just went over the different stages that is happening in interphase. So I have it drawn out here showing a picture of, you know, what's happening in the cell uh, during all of these stages. Um, pretty soon you'll be able to look at this and know exactly what these are showing you and what's happening. Uh, but this is a good depiction of the entire metaphase itself and then you can have a quick glance and make sure that you know what's going on and, and it, it's, it'll be helpful. Uh, and so um, mitosis is divided into five phases. So interphase is not one of the phases of mitosis. Um, mitosis starts with prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis is now the beginning of the new interphase uh, for the cell. Uh, and so I'll just kind of summarize really quick since we're looking at all of these pictures. Um, prophase, um, so this is kind of the, not the greatest picture because it is showing you that chromosomes are here in, prophase, in, in interphase. Don't be confused by that. Um, their chromosomes are being formed here. This is when the chromatin is actually going to be condensing uh, and, and becoming the chromosomes. Right at the beginning of prophase is when that is happening. Uh, and then you can see that the nucleus is starting to break up slightly. Um, and then the, the centrosomes are kind of moving from one, one pole to the next. Uh, prometaphase, you've got the nucleus broken all the way. Uh, the, chrome, the centrosomes are now at the different poles. Uh, you can see these little strings that are coming off. Those are the microtubules. Those microtubules, the cytoskeleton, is going to be attaching to each one of these chromosomes. It's going to be attaching to both sides. Metaphase, those chromosomes line up 
46 chromosomes for a human being will be all lined up on the equator. Anaphase, those sister chromatids are going to be broken off from one another and pulled to separate poles of the cell. Once they're pulled to the, nu to the centrosome, then a new nucleus will form around those cells, I'm sorry, around those chromosomes. And at this moment, they are single chromosomes. Once these sister chromatids have been broken apart, they are now, they are now single chromosomes. So here you would have 46 of them lining up. When they're broken apart, you now have 92 chromosomes in this one cell because the 46 have been broken apart into halves and they're going to one end or the other end. Uh, the nucleus is forming around them. You're starting to get a little bit of cleavage right here, uh, which is the squeezing in of the cell membrane. And then the cell itself will be splitting into two. So I will now pretty much talk about each of those phases with a little bit more detail. Uh, prophase, the things that you should know about prophase. And in each of these pictures, each set of picture, I show uh, the picture that I showed in the, in the set of pictures, uh, I kind of blow it up so you can see it, the individual picture. And then most of them also have an additional kind of drawing, um, another depiction of what's going on type of thing. Uh, so prophase, chromosomes are condensing. They are becoming the, chromosin, the chromosomes. The chromatin is condensing to make these chromosomes. The nuclear envelope is breaking down. So the nucleus itself is breaking down and exposing these chromosomes to the cytoplasm of the cell. Spindles uh, are forming. Um, if it was an animal cell, the centrosomes are producing lots of spindle fibers, microtubules, uh, to go throughout the cell, uh, extending from the poles. Now, if it was not an animal cell, uh, you would not see these centrosomes, but these microtubules would still be forming. They would just be coming from a different, a different, uh, a different central location. Prometaphase. So this is. You know, this phase between uh, prophase and metaphase. Uh, when I was in school, I didn't learn about prometaphase. I learned about prophase and then went straight to metaphase. Um, so prometaphase, uh, you know, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's just becoming more important of, of a subset um, uh, and transition phase to, to talk about. So in prometaphase, the nuclear envelope is gone. It's been broken up. Now in this picture, you know, you see little bits of it still like around, uh, but the nucleus itself is, the nuclear envelope has been dissolved, has been broken up. Microtubules of the spindle have attached to the sister chromatids. Uh, and so this pair of sister chromatins um, is connected together at the centromere. Next to each centromere is this quintocore. The quintocore is coming off the sides of the centromere. And this is the location that these spindles are going to attach to the different chromosomes. One spindle will be attaching to this side of the chromosome. The other side will be attached from this spindle. So each of these chromosomes will be kind of held on to and attached to both poles. In metaphase, those sister chromatins are lining up in the center of the cell, the spindle equator. And this is done so by the spindles themselves. The spindles attached in the prometaphase and now they're being used to line up these chromosomes. And so here we just see four chromosomes 
but in whatever cell we're talking about, um, in the human cell, you would have 46 of these lined up in the equator. That's a lot for a tiny little cell. Uh, but here it's depicted as just four. So all of the chromosomes uh, will be lining up. Um, this will be different when we get into meiosis, but it's good to know that these sister chromatids are lining up in the equator. Anaphase is when these sister chromatids are being broken apart, separated from one another, and pulled to the opposite ends of the cell. They are pulled to the poles of the cell. And so you can see how each of them uh, is attached to the spindle fiber and they're being pulled to the pole. So these used to be attached to one another, but then they broke apart and half is going one, half is going the other. Now again, these are sister chromatids to one another. They are identical DNA from one another. So this side of the cell is going to get the exact same DNA as this side. They are the same chromosomes. Now we're not talking about homologous chromosomes anywhere along the way. It could have been that you know these two are homologous to one another or it could be that these two are homologous to one another. It doesn't matter at this moment uh, we're discussing sister chromatids and so they're being pulled apart uh, and, and going to the each end of the pole each end of each pole of the cell. Telophase. In telophase, the spindle fibers themselves uh, are starting to dissipate. So you are not seeing these connections to the chromosomes uh, as much. Um, they're dissipating and kind of contracting back to the centrosome. The nuclear envelopes are starting to reform around the chromosomes. The picture shows that the nucleolus is starting to form as well. Uh, the centrosomes, the, sorry, the chromosomes are starting to uncoil. So the chromosomes are becoming less condensed uh, and they're going back to that chromatin form. So now that they're going back to this chromatin form, they're able to go through transcription and translation again, getting, getting ready to go back into the normal parts of a cell's life. Telophase, this is where you're going to see the first sign of cleavage. And so this picture shows the cleavage of the cell. Uh, and so you see that it's slowly pinching in the center. Uh, you see the cleavage on the other side. And so if you think about your fingers on either side of these um, parts of cleavage and you're just squeezing this cell in, kind of like a balloon, where now you know this, the, the liquid is getting pushed to either end and this is closing uh, even more so until it pinches completely and you have two separate cells. But that's not happening quite yet. Telophase is just the beginning of the cleavage. The cytokinesis is when that pinching becomes complete. Um, it's um, pinching in, pinching in, and then once it um, connects to itself, then you will have the complete division of cytoplasm. Cytokinesis uh, and the, the creation of two cells from one. This was the parent cell creating two daughter cells. These daughter cells are identical to one another. They have the same DNA as one another. Uh, now cytokinesis uh, can happen in different ways depending on what cell you're talking about. Um, in animal cells we have something called the cleavage furrow. In plant cells we have something called the cell plate formation. Most of what we are seeing uh, from the beginning, all of these stages, uh, they all have chrome, um, centrosomes, so they're all animal cells. And so what we're going, what we're looking through um, with this example that we just looked through, 
Uh, this is this cleavage furrow where it's kind of pinching in. Uh, but I'll have a different picture to show. And then uh, and then I'll have some pictures for a plant cell. The cleavage furrow. This is when the cell is going to be pinching in two, uh, pinching into two cells. Now we think of the pinching as this outside force, uh, but in reality the force is taking place inside. Uh, it is active, um, sorry, actin filaments that are contracting in the cell, uh, in the center, in the middle of the cell. So you look at this dotted line here. Uh, it is a filament, an actin filament, a cytoskeleton filament uh, that is attached to each side and it is contracting, pulling the center closer to one another uh, until eventually it will pinch off. Um, this is a great picture of uh, a microscope picture of, of a cell going through um, cytokinesis. The cleavage furrow first appears in telophase um, as an indention. It is just just that small little bit of cleavage, uh, and then it will get larger and larger, deeper and deeper. It deepens as the ring of proteins beneath the cell uh, of the membrane contracts. Plants do it a little bit different. They um, they pinch off or they uh, cytokinesis through. Uh, cell plate formation. Plant cells can't pinch because they have a cell wall. And so vesicles will line up in the center of the cell uh, with building blocks that are going to build these new cell walls. Uh, and so um, if we see this as the side view, um, the new nucleus that's forming on either side, and then these vesicles are going to start lining up in the center, bringing these blocks, bringing these materials to build a new cell wall. And so uh, as they go through time, eventually you'll have this new cell wall that is going to fully separate uh, the cell into two. You also will have this creation of a cell membrane as well taking place. Vesicles will fuse until the cell is split into two. So now you have two daughter cells from the parent cell. Both of these daughter cells have the same chromosome numbers as the parent cell. They are identical to one another. Uh, the chromosomes in these new daughter cells are unduplicated. Uh, they are single chrom well single chromosomes, but um, they will be in the chromatin form now that they're daughter cells. Um, but they, they are 2N right now. The parent cell was 2N. It divided into two daughter cells, and both daughter cells are now 2N. If this was a human cell, the parent cell would have 46 chromosomes, and each daughter cell would have 46 chromosomes. During meiosis, we have lots of chances for cancer cells to form. Uh, there's a lot of different stages in mitosis that uh, problems can arise. Uh, and then these problems can cause cancer cells to form. Uh, cancer cells are abnormal cells. Um, they're something gone wrong in their DNA and it allows them to uh, act differently than the rest of the cells in, in, the, in the body. So compared to regular body cells, cancer cells have distinct features. They have lost their specialization. Uh, this means you know, when you think of the different cells that make up an organism, and think about a human, uh, you know, we have nerve cells, we have skin cells, um, liver cells, kidney cells. Uh, even inside the kidney and liver themselves, there are lots of different types of cells within that organ. Um, and all of these cells have, they're very specialized in what they do. Even though they all have the same DNA, they have different proteins that are being expressed. 
uh, different traits that are being expressed into different proteins. So they are different cells, um, but all having the same DNA. Whereas now, um, a cancer cell will lose that specialization. It, come, it becomes this kind of generic kind of a cell. Not quite like a stem cell, but stem cells have more of this kind of generic type of cell formation. Um, so these, cell, these cancer cells are losing this specialization. They are becoming immortal. Uh, they can continue to divide endlessly. Uh, and as we learned during DNA replication, um, there are telomeres on the ends of our DNA, and these telomeres stop the DNA from being able to divide um, endlessly. Uh, each strand of DNA, each cell, uh, is only able to divide so many times. Uh, while cancer cells are able to regenerate those telomeres at the end of the chromosomes. And that's how they're able to just continuously divide over and over and become, quote unquote, immortal. So the cell cycle, uh, the cell itself during the cell cycle uh, is under tight control to prevent different errors. Um, yes, errors obviously still happen. Uh, cancer cells are seen quite often, uh, but the cell is able to stop these errors um, a lot of the time. And so they have these um, series of chemical checkpoints that will regulate the cell cycle. And so in this cell cycle, we've seen this picture before, um, at each of these stop signs is this checkpoint um, that we're talking about, that kind of uh, checking to make sure that everything is the way it should be. Um, and so these checkpoints ensure that all DNA has replicated, that DNA is not damaged, chromosomes are lining up properly. And so if we see, we see this checkpoint here, this G1 checkpoint, um, making sure um, the endonuclease is going through, uh, making sure that there is no damaged DNA, that all the DNA is uh, good to go. Um, if there are problems, it could possibly fix them, uh, depending on what those problems could be. If all of those problems, if there are no problems or problems have been solved, then it's able to go into that S phase uh, with the DNA replication. Afterwards, there's a checkpoint. Is DNA replicating correctly? Did it replicate correctly? Uh, and there are enzymes that go through and make sure that this is taking place. Uh, if not, can it be fixed? Uh, if there are no problems, it moves into the next phase, uh, this G2 phase. Uh, and so there is a G2 checkpoint, making sure that, again, DNA has replicated correctly and there are no problems with the DNA, no damage. Um, there are also checkpoints making sure that the spindles are being made correctly. And then in metaphase itself, there is a checkpoint in metaphase. Is, are the quinto cores attached to the spindles? Uh, are chromosomes aligned down the equator. So if you have a, you know, you have all chromosomes lined up to, in the equator, but then there's one that's not attached uh, to these spindle fibers, it's just off to the side, well, when cell division takes place, you will not have identical chromosomes in each new daughter cell. You'll have one with an extra um, an extra sister chromatid and then the other cell doesn't have that one at all and this is going to be lots of problems um, if, if this takes place. Now, if these errors occur, one way that the cell can deal with it is through apoptosis. Apoptosis, again, is programmed cell death. And so if a cell is unable to go through this cycle because there is problems, uh, then it will automatically kill itself, um, go through apoptosis so that there is 
an insurance that there is no problems that are going to replicate further down the line. Uh, and there are, at each of these checkpoints, uh, there are different proteins that will be functioning and allowing um, the readings, the proof readings, the checking and all this thing, lots of different proteins that are uh, proteins and enzymes that are working together here. Some uh, that we'll be talking about um, or that you'll be needing to know. Uh, tumor suppressors, and these are these are checkpoint proteins that inhibit mitosis. And so if there is some sort of a problem with the cell and um, it wants to stop it from continuing to go through mitosis, uh, then tumor suppressors will allow that to take place. Those, these proteins, these enzymes will kind of put it on halt uh, before apoptosis takes place and kind of stop it from going through mitosis. Uh, proto-oncogenes are checkpoint proteins that will stimulate mitosis. And so um, if the cell has gone through uh, this checkpoint and everything's good to go, well, these proto-oncogene proteins will kind of stimulate to continue into the next stage of mitosis, kind of pushing it forward. If either of these two has a malfunction, has a mutation, something goes wrong with either of these two uh, proteins or pieces of DNA that is going to transcribe and translate to these proteins, then you can cause cancer this way. Uh, so these two, these two areas of the DNA, uh, if they are damaged or mutated, um, it's more likely that a cancer cell can form because of this. Uh, and so the reason being is if nothing is stopping, if nothing is stopping mitosis uh, from continuing on, well then a cell could possibly divide endlessly. Um, if um, something, if a malfunction happens in a proto-oncogene where it's not supposed to stimulate mitosis, but it's being used to stimulate it um, more and more, well then you can have uncontrolled division as well. So if you had a problem with either of these two and they're not doing what they're supposed to do, then you can see that a cell is going to be pushed or not stopped into going through more and more mitosis. So more and more division taking place. And that is uh, a problem when it comes to cancer cells. Basically, cancer cells um, are this uh, cell that is uncontrollably dividing. Uh, so cancer cells, um, they're kind of uh, certain characteristics that go along with cancer cells. Uh, uncontrolled cell division. Uh, tumors are a mass of cells that arise after mutations in genes that control cell growth and division. Cancers can be malignant forms of tumors, uh, which means they're growing rapidly and they're spreading throughout the body. And so you can see this tumor right here uh, is growing in the tissue. Um, you've got the lymph node vesicle here, um, and, or the lymph vessel um, and the blood vessel. Uh, and so if this tumor is growing and cells can break off from this tumor, and then go into either of these two vessels, they're able to spread throughout the body. Um, when they are going through the blood vessels, they can attach to any other part of the body. Once they get through, they can then cause tumors here and here and all over the place, anywhere that blood vessels go. Uh, but tumors can also be benign, um, which is considered not harmful. Uh, and so you see that this tumor has formed, but the body defended against it. It noticed that this tumor was there, and it put a capsule around it. And so the capsule is basically this kind of like a, a wall that goes around the tumor, 
that won't allow it to grow anymore. It's physically stopping it from growing um, any bigger. Uh, so four characteristics of cancerous cells. The plasma membrane and uh, cytoplasm are altered. Uh, and this, uh, this has to do with kind of, um, you know, this will alter the shape of the cell. Uh, and so it'll change the proteins that are on the outside of the side of outside of the membrane um, and so they will be communicating slightly different with the other cells around them uh, they'll be not connecting to the other cells that are around them and, and they'll be acting in different ways than normal cells they will be growing and dividing abnormally and so uh, they will be continuously growing um, there's nothing holding them back they're just going going to be continuously growing and growing uh, and dividing and dividing. Um, metastasizing, uh, they will be, uh, their ability to adhere to other cells will be decreased. Um, oh, sorry, I said metastasizing. Uh, metastasis. Uh, this is the, the this change in the membrane is allowing them not to connect to one another as easily. Uh, and this is one way that they're able to break off from one another and go to different parts of the body and create a new tumor. Uh, and this can be lethal. Uh, in a couple, a couple ways that this can be lethal. Uh, if you have a tumor growing in particular parts of the body, let's say in your brain um, or in your heart, uh, certain areas, um, the cells that are supposed to be there are working together to do a certain job. If you put this large tumor in between these cells and kind of separate them um, as this tumor is growing and growing, it can be a physical hindrance, um, stopping blood from getting to those cells and causing damage that way, uh, pushing these cells apart, maybe that they're, they're not communicating with one another anymore, they're not able to transfer different uh, proteins to one another, and so it could be a physical, uh, physically kind of a hindrance. Um, you also have these large growing tumors that are needing blood. They're needing oxygen. They're needing nutrients. In order to divide, this is a lot of energy. So they're taking all of these nutrients and all of these things uh, from the other cells. Uh, they're taking it, um, taking it away. Uh, and so um, some nutrients that are needed to the other cells that are doing their normal functions, uh, those nutrients are being sucked away for the tumor itself that is, you know, crazily dividing and needing all of this extra um, calories and things like that to, to do what it needs to do. Uh, and so the normal cells are kind of losing out in that situation. Uh, there are treatments to cancers. Uh, surgery, uh, trying to remove all or part of the tumor itself. Uh, chemotherapy. Um, the use of cancer killing drugs uh, it's possible that it could harm good drug um, the good cells the normal cells it all depends on how it's focusing on those cancer cells I mean cancer cells are still your cells so whatever type of treatment uh, it's you know it it would be best if it could hone in just on those cancer cells but sometimes that could be difficult immunotherapy stimulating your own immune system to kill the cancer so your immune system has its own defense and so if you kind of stimulate your immune system maybe you can let it do what it does best uh, radiation uh, so radiation can kill or shrink a tumor uh, some of this radiation depending on how it is given to the body um, might not be specific to the the cancer cell itself and it could affect 
other cells. Um, I think your bone marrow is very receptive to radiation. Certain cells of your body can be um, more harmed by radiation than others, and so this is always a, a problem. Uh, and then new drugs are always being worked on, um, trying to target cells, cancer cells specifically. Um, this is a this is a big, big part of the medical field um, dealing with all of these cancers. Well, we're just generally talking about cancers, but each organ of the body has the ability to kind of create its own cancer cells, um, and each of them can act in different ways. And so it's, you know, it, there's a lot of focusing on specifics here. Cancer is usually not dealt with in a general term. It's kind of um, a lot of these specific types of cancer are, are dealt in different ways.